Yeah, right, Monkeries. I think I I don't think I have it as a Moto deck list of the changes that I would that I would make in Vintage Cube. Cuz it unsorts when you save it as a deck file. So I'm I'm like certain that I deleted it. Oh, I have it here. Yeah, I had these all sorted in order of like egregious, most egregious to least egregious. And then I had potential ads over here. So it'll be kind of cute to compare them. Let's see what Ryan's been. I can't really like keep it all on the same page or whatever. Oh shit, what up? Maybe we can come back and check this. If we want to compare different colors and stuff. The side left is like proposed cuts, then beside the right side was proposed ads. It wasn't like a direct one for one or whatever. But I think some of the this um some of my my thoughts are on the same page. Oh shit, what up, P Night Farmer? Thanks for 14 months. Fallen Shinobi was brought back. Yeah, that fucking echo. Would it come from my my window capture? <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. Maybe it makes sense. Shouldn't I be able to mute that in OBS somewhere? The window capture of this text file? Shouldn't I be able to just like straight up mute it? Shouldn't there be some setting? Maybe add a filter? An effect filter to let me mute it? I don't know where else the echo could be coming from. Good evening, Artex. Good evening, indeed. Filters, properties, order. Am I near a cave? Is that where the echo's coming from? No, the echo's coming from a setting somewhere. Or um, something getting like double copied. Usually an echo comes when I've got a window of my stream up. But that doesn't appear to be the case. Hey, one second. Choop. I'll go to Blanksville and delete some things. I feel like I would not be having this problem if I was using XSplit. I could just mute the uh, the actual notification on the alert box, which I kind of hate, but whatever. Just gotta remember to turn it back on. Brian Spain is not back at Wizards. Wizards does not run Magic Online anymore. the notification sound so hopefully hopefully that'll fix things for me while I do this 
cool. Well, now we can get started. We can begin. All right, first change. Yorian to Soul Herder. What do we think? I know some folks like Yorian. I'm, I'm never a big fan of the uh, the attempt, the attempt to make a 60 card deck because it kind of stretches your mana in really awkward ways. Every duel, for example, you're just like less likely to draw it, so your mana base is worse. And in the the higher powered formats, like obviously in its its regular limited format, having a free four or five was insane. It was just like always worth it to play Yorian. Um, in its base limited format, but Vintage Cube is, is so much more powerful. A Soul Herder is a sweet card. Soul Herder like also a constructed worthy card. You think it's a plus change? I think it's a plus. I'm not gonna give it like a string of plus marks or whatever, because some folks like Yorian, but I'll actually play Soul Herder sometimes. I think it's good. Nice to build around. Yeah. You don't think Blink is a strong vintage cube archetype? You're probably right about that too. Yeah, I like cutting the Orient. I'm not sure I would have added Soul Herder. All right, Corpse Dance to Gorio's Vengeance. I kind of, I gotta admit, I don't really care. <laughs> I don't, I don't care about this change at all. Um, with the instant speed reanimator with Emrakul, it is a little easier on the mana. You know, two mana instead of three mana. I'm just gonna put equal. You hate it, you love Corpse Dance. Corpse Dance is the more boomer card. <laughs> Crypt Breaker to Cabal Therapist. <laughs> so, <laughs> at this stage in the game, at this stage in Magic the Gathering, I think people have cast Cabal Therapist before and found it to be not playable in any setting in Magic. Just stone unplayable should not, should not be in formats where you want people to pick it as a card and cast it because it's bad. I, th I don't think I'm like al alone in this. I don't think it's like a an unintuitive, like groundbreaking thing about Cabal Therapist. It's, it's just not a good card. And it doesn't really have any iconic vintage cube things. Like Cabal Therapy is a weird card in a solo format, but so is Cabal Therapist. But Cabal Therapy, like at least has some iconic ideas behind it. And they added some things that would want sacrifice outlets and I could see actually playing Therapy every once in a while. I might end up playing Therapist and changing my mind about it, but I think it's kind of unlikely. I think it's kind of garbage. How can it be bad? It got so much hype, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was so hyped and then so terrible. Hey, Bobo Triple O, thanks for the sob, thanks for the 74 months. Crit Breaker's just better overall. Yeah, Crit Breaker was like a filler card that would like draw a few cards sometimes. And it wasn't bad with Recurring Nightmare. I, I don't think Crit Breaker is like some sacred cow that can't be cut. Obviously, it's a cuttable card. Um, but I would have cut, cut it for a better card, not a, not a worse card, is, is what I would have done. Because <laughs> it was already like on the edge, you know? And basically, you just cut a card that like saw a little bit of play for a card that's going to see no play. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my, my question mark rating again with Thought Picker Witch for Evolved Sleeper. I think this this switch is more egregious because Evolved Sleeper was um, not just better in quotation marks, but uh, just a kind of a straight up better card. Like an actual good card that could win games of magic. And I I don't think Thought Picker Witch is gonna be that. I think Thought Picker Witch is gonna be another last pick. If all sleeper was really good, it would win games of Magic the Gathering. <laughs> it was like one of the the, the few uh, good red early plays. And now it's just not in there. I don't know. I could see cutting it for like the pump knight because they're like kind of similar, but that's about it. Which is a better card than Therapist? Which is a better card than Therapist? You're not wrong about that. But yeah, both of those picks are a little perplexing to me.
Yeah, I mean black. We're in the black section here. Gix got cut for Midnight Reaper. Um, which I don't like. G I think Gix is a more powerful card than Midnight Reaper. I was skeptical of Gix when it was first added to the Vintage Cube, but it does win games. You never really activate its big mana ability, but like the threat of it matters sometimes. I mean, that Reaper's good though. I'm gonna I'm gonna call this one neutral. Reaper's so mid. I mean, Reaper can draw a lot of cards. That's what I want to do. I want to I want to draw those cards. And that, and that kind of gets to my big issue with Sacrifice. I like, the, so, uh, spoiler, they've added some drain effects for the Sacrifice um, archetype, which it's needed, you know? Like, you can't just have a bunch of, like, sac, sac outlets and recursive black creatures and not have the drain effect, because then you don't, you can't really assemble a coherent deck, right? You can't actually kill people. So the drain effects are gonna make it a lot more playable, I think, even with some, some duds added, but, um, they haven't added the best Black Sacrifice card, which is Yawgmoth. Um, <laughs> because it draws all the cards and kills everything and has all those sweet abilities. Anyway. But moving on. Massacre Worm and Meat Hook Massacre. I think this is a positive change for the reason that I just said. Massacre Worm was like a fine card and a good board in, you know, host some token strats. Really cool to just kill somebody by casting a single six drop creature. And watching all those triggers stack, really, really satisfying. But Meat Hook Massacre is like obviously a great card, and uh, I think will fit what they're trying for with Black better. Like it's a control card, but it's also a card that fits the um, the Dream Package, the Sacrifice deck that they're trying to make work. So that's good. A, a card that can fit multiple different archetypes is kind of always a good add. Whereas Massacre Worm was like very specific, right? It's like you can only play this in this sort of deck. Whereas Massacre, Meat Hook Massacre is going to go into a lot of different things. And it's overall probably just a better card, right? If we're going to be honest with ourselves. You wish we could have both? Yeah, all Massacre Cube. <laughs> Get actual Massacre in there. The one that, like, I think if they have a Plains, you play it for free. All things get minus two, minus two. Draft Massacre Tribal. Yeah, Massacre Girl. All right, pack work, pack rat versus rotting regisar. Um, so I have strong feelings about this swap of pack rat for regisar. Two, these are both two of my favorite cube cards, and I've played them both to death in many cubes, not just vintage cube. And uh, Ryan's reasoning here is that they both have similar awkward Plan B discard roles. This is true. They can both be played as awkward discard outlets and reanimator. And then he concludes, but Reggie is a better plan A. And I love Rotting Regisar. It's one of my favorite cards. He is not a better plan A than Packrat. Rotting Regisar is infinitely chumpable. And Packrat has salvaged so many dumpster fire fucking <laughs> stips for me over the years. You can't chump, just chump a Packrat, right? And you can do that with rot Rotting Regisar. You also have a lot more control with Pack Rat when you discard how much you discard. You don't have that kind of control with Rotting Regisar either. So I, I disagree that it's a better plan A, and I don't I don't think it's a better card as much as I love Reggie, as much as I love playing Reggie on turn one off a of Dark Ritual or what have you. I'm gonna I'm gonna give this a minus. Pack Rat over Una's Prowler. Yeah, right? Cut one of the actual bad cards. Pack rat. Yeah, pack rat can like save your deck by itself. Riding Registrar doesn't do that. Not a big consideration, Pineapple. Hey, Soft Gnome. Thanks for the sub. Thanks for the 40 months. Appreciate you. Right, pack rats out, Cabal Therapist in. <laughs> Blood Artist for Scrap Heap Scrounger. See, I think this is a necessary addition 
for um, for Black Sacrifice to work. Um, before Carmen like kind of kind of dipped her toe into adding Black Sacrifice to the cube, but didn't have the drain effects that like actually made it a functioning archetype. And so we're leaning further into that as a way to like solve black, which I think is a fine approach. Like either either pull back away from it entirely and have like only individually good black cards that can all win games on their own or lean harder into the synergy thing. Obviously, don't cut cards for a Cabal Therapist and Thought Picker Witch, but, <laughs> but having um, some good drain effects seems intuitive to me towards making the, the archetype like actually work for black. And Scrap Peep Scrounger is a fine cut. You know, it was, it was a reasonable card that could fit in other aggressive archetypes and stuff, but it was always filler in those archetypes. Other decks aren't missing much from losing Scrap Peep. Every once in a while, it was nice to have a, a, a playable artifact creature. When I would try drafting the Tlarian Academy and Gaia's Cradle deck, for example, <laughs> something like Scrap Peep Scrounger would work fine. Or if you ever did something like Workshop's Aggro, which again is extremely niche. So a few a few like very niche decks are losing Scrounger. That said, it does play well in the Sacrifice deck that we're leaning into, so. And we have another kind of cut here too. I'm gonna say that's a plus overall because I think Black needed a Blood Artist. So it's not the cut I would have made, but I'll give it a plus. Jadara is a nice one. Yeah. Um, and they both play well with uh, with Skull Clamp, huh? Jadar pl probably plays even better with Skull Clamp than Shade does. Yeah, Jadar's a great card. I'm gonna give that one a plus too. I think it's an upgrade. Not a huge upgrade. I don't think Shade was the first card I would cut, but it is an upgrade nonetheless. I'm into it. Takanuma for Phyrexian Tower seems like a big plus especially with the other Sacrifice Matters cards that have been added to the cube. I'm gonna give it two pluses. I saw some people talking about, I don't think we even need to talk about this that much, right? And like Tekanuma saw some play, but it was just cause it was like free. It was just a filler card. I saw some people talking about Paradoxical Outcome in the sense that it would actually see play and be good in this vintage cube. And I, I think they're wrong. <laughs> I think I've played Paradoxical Outcome in Cube before, and I've tried to make it work in Legacy, and it's just uh, it's just not a good card outside of like Vintage specifically. If you don't have like every single Moxen in your deck, it's it's not very good. And it's very good if you do have every single Moxen, but you're never getting that in Vintage Cube. You're getting like one or two Moxen. You know what I mean? So the times that this card actually shows up are actually going to be like kind of kind of low, kind of small, I think. What if you pick up four elves and then have to like replay your elves and then they have summoning sickness? That sounds rancid, not me, not gonna lie. Again, I, I have cast this card in cube, I have cast it in legacy, I've cast it in vintage, I've cast it in a bunch of different settings. I've cast it in uh, standard, I've cast it in uh, historic. Um, there are very few times where this card is like actually playable. There's, like if it's, if it's not a historical playable card, then why are you why are you trying to make it work in Vintage Cube? Is is kind of is kind of where I'm coming at with this card. Cutting Academy Ruins is good, but like you're switching a dud for a dud. I'm gonna say this is equal. I actually think Academy Ruins, even though it only saw niche play as a Mind Slaver lock, at the end of the day, will end up being a more playable card than Paradoxical Outcome. Drafted more, played more, wins more games. I, I think it's like a like a pure dud. People will make it work, but I mean, people also made this card work sometimes, right? Have they added more zeros? They did add a few more zeros, but like, I don't think a couple of zeros changes, changes your outcome with paradoxical outcome.
The Kelly Ruins is not a real card, yet yeah, neither is this one. <laughs> dud for dud. I would have neither of these cards in the cube. Gilded Drake for Rona. So Gilded Drake wasn't that bad. People uh, like remarked that it was bad, but it had like some nice a nice nostalgia component, and then it was a good sideboard card, and it was really good to play alongside bounce effects, like repeal and such. Or sometimes you'd play it with for like Jace bouncing and stuff. It had its spot. That said, Rona's a really nice ad. Rona's a really sweet card. And a good card, and I think it's gonna win a lot of games. I think it's gonna be a very good vintage cube. So overall, I'm giving this a plus. Hullbreaker Horror swatched out for e swapped out for Agent of Treachery. Um, so Hullbreaker Horror was sweet in uh, what's the format where you where you um, draft a card from each pack? Or two cards from each pack. Vintage Supreme. Vintage Supreme. Hullbreaker Horror was really sweet in that format, and it was kind of it was kind of iffy in regular Vintage Cube just because it was so slow. Um, but it was powerful once you actually like got there, and it certainly beat some decks. And I think Agent of Treachery is sort of similar. The big plus of Agent of Treachery. So the plus of Hullbreaker Horror is you could just use it to beat um, control decks, right? Decks that had counter magic. It wasn't like an actual card for that, and uh, something to do with if you had a big ton of mana and stuff. But Agent of Treachery um, doesn't fill that role, but it is sweet with Recurring Nightmare. And with that in mind, I am excited to play it with in, in that shell, in the Recurring Nightmare shell. Show and tell your agent, show and tell, not a legal card, not in the cube. Hullbreaker Horror and Paradoxical Outcome are both similar, in that if this was Vintage Supreme, like, both of those cards would be very exciting. But it's not Vintage Supreme, so they're both just, like, a lot more niche. Hullbreaker Horror, obviously, better than Outcome, but... <clears throat> Makes Soul Herder better? The Agent of Treachery? Yeah, I suppose so. Legend Shredder for Ludril Core seems like a big downgrade. Especially because we like have just way better looters, right? We've got the one that flips into a werewolf that's just like a strict upgrade to Ludril Core. We've got fucking Rona getting added in. And Legend Shredder is like an actual good card. And Ludril Core is super not. <laughs> like one of these sees vintage, actual vintage play, and the other one is laughable in that format. This is a this is a boomer swap. And overall, like a big negative. I don't understand it. It seems like a pure nostalgia thing. I'm gonna give that one a question mark. Not a triple question mark, because you will actually play Looter Lacor and, you know, hit people with loot with it and it can carry an equipment and stuff. But I think cutting it was a good change for Vintage Cube in retrospect. And I'm not sure why it's getting added again. Hey, Cidivine, this is 64 months. Brain Geyser for Memory Deluge. Yeah, that swap's getting some hate. Um, I mean, Memory Deluge is obviously a better card. Brain Geyser at least has, like, nostalgia attached, right? Like, boomer nostalgia. And it's not a strict down downgrade in that you can actually kill someone with Brain Geyser. Like, you can do the Stroke of Genius thing where you target your opponent, right? I'm not misremembering this card. Why isn't Seed Shark getting added? Maybe other people don't like that card as much as I do. Yeah, Brain Geyser's target player draws X cards, and it is a 40 card format. I wouldn't be cutting Splash Yawk and adding Brain Geyser, you know, I'd be like leaning into the, the mill strat, but it is an alternate win condition where Memory Deluge is not. It's also a Mana Sync where Memory Deluge is not. The ceiling's certainly higher on Brain Geyser. Um, but I'm, I'm hesitant to give this a plus overall, because Memory Deluge is so good. Like a, an actual Factor Fiction replacement if you don't get Factor Fiction. I might change my mind on that one, but for now I'm giving it a, I'm punching in an equal. Correct, they did not add Shark.
Murktide Regent for Displacer Kitten. Um, I think this is a minus. I don't think there's like enough ways to go infinite with Displacer Kitten. You can just play it as like a blink card, but it's kind of clunky as a blink card. I've played with it in a few cubes at this point. I messed around with it in Legacy and, and stuff. The issue with Displacer Kitten is that while you can go infinite with it, there's only like a few cards that actually let you do so conveniently. You like kind of need three mana to fairy, right? And then some zeros on top of it, things of that nature. I might be wrong on that one, but I also like Murktide Regent more than most people. Like that card fucking kills people. Hey Duke Wiggles, thanks for the sub, thanks for the 52 months. And Murktide Regent was a card that you could kill people with outside of the blue tempo deck, which was consistent and good without being too good. And I think it loses something here, huh? Will I be playing later? Yeah, whenever, whenever I'm fucking done with this, David. I'm not gonna like finish this and stare at a blank screen. But there's a lot of colors and stuff, so I'm not looking forward to getting that question a lot. <laughs> Splash Bolt, Displacer Kitten? If you're, if you're drafting Displacer Kitten, you're drafting a dedicated deck around it. You're not trying to splash this card. So the, the one blue versus double blue on Murktide doesn't actually mean anything. Chain of Vapor versus Repeal. So I actually think Repeal is a better card than Chain of Vapor, but Chain of Vapor does have like old school nostalgia. Where can you see this article? Isn't the fucking literal article title here on screen? <laughs> I searched Magic the Gathering online and this was the news article for today. It's 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 on screen. <laughs> Man, people really need to learn how to Google. I would actually not give someone the direct link <laughs> if they like can't find it. I'm not sure how they find Magic Online to play and install. <laughs> like, why would they care about the Vintage Cube? Anyway. Dream Halls for show and tell. Oh, I haven't uh, put in the rating for repeal for Chain of Vapor. I'm gonna put equal, but um, not stoked about that swamp. Not stoked about it, not really sad about it. Hey, Gaptoles, takes the 15 months. Can we hurry up to the blank screen stream, please? Yeah, I'll get right there. Yeah, so show and tell has not been a great card in Vintage Cube, but you can kill people with it. And you can board it in against aggro and like show and tell out. Like say you're facing reanimator or something. Or, I'm sorry. Say you're facing um, an aggro deck and you're a reanimator player. You can board in show and tell as an alternate way to cheat in some fatties. And then whatever they put into play isn't gonna like murder you. So the article is right that Show and Tell does have a reputation as a trap card. That said, it does occasionally win games, and I don't I don't think Dream Halls is gonna do that. So Dream Halls, Dream Halls is not new to Vintage Cube. It was in Vintage Cube for a long time, and it wasn't good. It, like it wasn't good 13 years ago when Vintage Cube was first brought to Magic Online. So I don't know why it's getting added back in. It's uh um 
Yeah. Like I would I would not cut a, a trap card that occasionally wins games for something that just doesn't really win games. We'll see. We'll see if I end up being wrong about that. But I think I think overall this is a minus. I don't think show and tell is some sacred cow that you can't cut, but I wouldn't cut it for dream halls. I'd cut it for a playable card. You're giving it two question marks? I'm gonna give it a single question mark because show and tell specifically is getting cut. But uh, yeah, if they were cutting an actual good card, it would get two. <laughs> All right, I need some more water actually. And we just finished the blue section. So I'm gonna take a quick break while we go do that. I'll be back in a sec. Oh, that's nice, Kenexide. It is a sweet card in Dream Halls. I can't really argue with that. Yeah, you can't Dream Halls Eldrazi, right? That's a huge downside. All right. Whew. I should actually drink some of this water before. A lot of talking. Wearing tear for Aurelia. So a lot of people are gonna think this is a slam dunk. I think it is a good swap. But I think Aurelia was like kind of underrated. Cause it is an extremely powerful creature that does kind of kill people. And I did die to it a few times last cube season. That said, wear and tear is sweet. And like an obviously good card. Whereas Aurelia was a bit more niche. So I think that's a plus. Cityscape leveler for Calder Complete. So I would have liked bringing Calder Complete back in. I think it's a really sick one for Stoneforge Mystic. I do not like cutting Cityscape leveler. Cityscape leveler, I think, more than proved itself last Vintage Cube season. Um, I drafted it a lot, I played it a lot, I won a lot with it. It was very good. It was a really nice addition to the Workshops deck and uh, it made Metalworker look a lot better. So I'm, I'm gonna give this swap a minus. Cityscape Leveler also like was not something that only saw play in one archetype. Like I played it in like elves and shit too. Card's just good. Does something even if the opponent's got a counter spell. I think I, he, he's saying that he wanted an option for this slot that would touch on more archetypes than leveler, but I actually think leveler is a more diverse card than Calder Complete. Calder you pretty much only want in your Stoneforge Mystic deck. I'll play it in workshops and stuff, but it's real, really, really like a C minus card there, especially in comparison to Lovely. I don't agree with him that it's an interesting card for Blink decks. All right, Solemn for Forge Master. Um, I think this is a plus. Forge Master was a card that was fine in some workshops decks, but you couldn't really build around it unless you already had Tinker. So it was like your backup Tinker. So a card that only does something if you already have um, this one build around. And even then it's worse than finding cards that tutor for Tinker, like Mystical Tutor or whatever. Just having the better card more consistently. It is something to play off workshops, but so is Solemn. Oh, that's not a fucking plus. There we are. Uh, I didn't miss Solemn when it was cut as much as I thought I would, but I also don't think I'm gonna miss Forge Master at all, especially without uh, Lightning Greaves in the cube. I do think Lightning Greaves should be in the cube, and then if you have Lightning Greaves, then Forge Master makes a lot of sense. But without Greaves, I think this swap makes, makes a lot of sense too. Right, man with hats. Forge Master was filler if you were already in that deck. It wasn't like a draw to play that deck. It wasn't like an especially good payoff. It was filler for like one niche archetype. 
And Solemn, Solemn is like better in a workshop stack than a non-workshop stack, but it can still see play outside of outside of that. So I agree, I agree with that analysis 100%. We got a pretty zesty one coming up here. Retrofritter for Candelabra. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sip this Mountain Dew for a second and hear Yalt's takes. <laughs> so that was my, that was my initial reaction as well, because Retrofitter is like really good it's a really good card and it plays really well with the artifact sub theme in vintage cube and it's good with like cards like skull clamp and it's a really fitting for urza and it buffs your Tolarian academies and guys cradles and stuff candelabra is also kind of cool with guys cradle and uh, Tolarian academy but it seems like retrofit is just way better right Hey, we're only 318. Thanks for the sob of 82 months. I can see that mana works. I can see adding Candelabra, but not cutting Retrofit Aim. And I think that's what I would have done. Um, if I wanted to add Candelabra. Retrofitter, Retrofitter has kind of earned its slot at this point. I'm going to give it a minus. I'm not going to give it a string of question marks until I've actually played with Candelabra. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and reserve judgment. One of the awkward things is it's just like not very good with Urza's, Urza's saga, right? Because it needs to be in play to untap the saga for value. And this is a singleton format, so if your first saga gets Candelabra, like you need to have something else already for it, like Academy or something. I'm gonna give it one question mark. Smokestack is out for Aetherflux Reservoir. Um, I know not everybody likes Smokestack, but I'm sure my viewers will understand where I'm coming from on this one. Because y'all have seen me grind a lot of people down with this card and just like straight up murder. I think a lot of the reason that uh, Smokestack isn't more popular is because maybe people don't want to win that way, or maybe people are just bad with it. I remember I posted like the nuttiest smokestack opening I've ever seen on Twitter, and some people were just like confused. <laughs> like they didn't think it was that nutty because they just didn't understand how smokestack wins the game by itself if you play it on turn one. It was like a turn one smokestack off of Soul Ring with like days backup and um, and like time walk, worm coil engine. It was it was it was just like kind of nutty, or it was, it was recall worm coil engine or whatever. Like ancestral recall was like the worst card in the hand. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, so I could see versions of Vintage Cube that don't have smokestack, but I think you need to have a really good reason to cut it. Um, it's an iconic card. It like kind of gives you an archetype all of its own. Like it was the one prison card that could just win games on its own. It was worth building around. I won games just by like tinkering for smokestack, you know. Aetherflux Reservoir is a storm card. For the most part. I think it's here to be like a win condition for the Paradoxical Outcome deck, but the Paradoxical Outcome deck can use any old storm card to win. Any old thing, right? Like once you've drawn all the cards in the world. You don't need something specific. Aetherflux Reservoir is really specific. Like it doesn't even play well in every Storm deck or every combo deck. It's it's kind of similar to adding Grape Shot. Right, it's called Stacks for a reason, yeah. Oh, thank you, Kenixai.
Yeah, this is one of the vin best vintage cube hands I've like literally ever seen. <laughs> and there are some people in the comments that were <laughs> that were unsure about it. This hand seems kind of mid. What if they just swords the worm coil engine? Like, friend, the worm coil engine is not the exciting part here. <laughs> yeah. That hand won, by the way. It didn't. It didn't lose. <laughs> it's nowhere close. Nowhere close to a losing hand. There's a. There's very few hands in Vintage Cube that can actually play a game of magic against this hand. Extremely few. You would need to have. Like, like yeah, a very nutty hand from the opponent to beat this. They'd have to be on like the Nutter Butters Storm deck or something. And even then, a lot of their draws just aren't winning. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. You're welcome, Eric. Lotus plus Force of Will. Yeah, right. Something like that. Because you still have to beat the days. Anyway. Um. So yeah, I'm obviously not a fan of cutting Smokestack. Uh, I could see it if, if like something really cool and unique and good was being added. I don't think that's happening with Aether Flux Reservoir. I think we're cutting um, a good iconic card and, and adding a dud. Sword of Body and Mind for Zernorb. So Sword of Body and Mind is better than people realize in 40 card formats. Because you can two shot some people. There is some downside, like maybe you hit somebody and give them a reanimation target or something. But it's a good card. It's a good Vintage Cube card. It's not the worst sword. That said, Zernorb's a sweet add. Zernorb's on my list of, of uh, cards that I would consider adding. Right? I have it in here somewhere. I do have it in here somewhere. Zernorb's a cool card to get with Urza Saga against Burn. It also just like plays really well with a lot of cards that are in Vintage Cube already. It gives like Fast Bomb combo another way to do the thing. There's like three crucible effects in this cube. Maybe more if you count uh, like life from the loam or whatever. And there's not enough things to go around that are actually good to do with them. An infinite life is certainly good. Now you can make that work without Corsair. And Zernorb is like often easier to tutor up than Corsair and, and um, anyway. Corsair might not even get opened. And then Zerun Orb's also a zero mana artifact that's not completely worthless, right? And it can actually do work in some matchups. Overall, I think this is a good swap. As a fan of Sword of Body and Mind, I still think this is a good swap. I'm gonna give it a plus. Cool boomer card is cool. And again, it can also win games. I play this card in my uh, in my Camlander deck. <laughs> Wire for Spyglass. So I know I just like full throatedly defended Smokestank. Uh, I'm not going to do that with Tangle Wire. I don't care about the swap at all. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't. I don't care about these cards. <sighs> Unlicensed Hurst for Helm of Awakening. Yeah, I guess Helm is another card that's supposed to play well with Reservoir and Paradoxical Outcome. It's a really double-edged sword, though, huh? Helm of Awakening. And hers, hers was good. Like, not even as a sideboard card, necessarily. Like, if you were... Like, Mono Red, for example, was weak to Reanimator and weak to Uro stuff. And, and hers is good against both of those archetypes. So I would main deck Hearse in, in Mono Red a lot of the time. I don't think it was as good in Mono White, because Mono White's not weak to those cards. So my opinion of this swap is going to depend on whether or not Helm of Awakening actually does make archetypes better. Um, I'm tempted to give it a minus, but I'm going to give it an equals for now. Like We'll give it time. Type deal. I am skeptical, but, uh, but willing to give it a fair shake. Helm of Awakening is a powerful card. For sure. Oh yeah, Spell Skittles. I've got opinions. I've got opinions. I've got the wrong helm, do I? Too many fucking cards with the same goddamn name. No, I have the right helm. All spells cost one mana less to play. 
So it is a double-edged sword. Like, your opponent can use Helm of Awakening, too. Like, now they're manually costs one less, you know, to interrupt your combo. Chad had the wrong helm. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so I'm neutral. I think it's, like, likely to be a bad change, but I'm neutral for now. Thief of Sanity for Ashiok. So, Ashiok, I think, is gonna end up winning more games than Thief of Sanity. Thief of Sanity is a sweet card, and I'm excited to play with it again. Um, Overall, I'm, I'm gonna give it an equals. They're both sweet to play in your time walk deck. Um, yeah. <laughs> some people are gonna be sad, some people are gonna be happy. I don't think it's that big of a shakeup either way. They're both powerful cards that can steal games. Thief of Sanity is just, just a little bit easier to answer, right? A single burn spell or whatever. There are way more ways of interacting with Thief, for sure. Sounds like chat's more uh, more on the positive side, actually, which I'm surprised by. Tezzeret, Agent of Bolas for Kaido. I'm gonna give this two pluses. <laughs> and and uh, people that know my um, my proclivities, people that know my tastes, probably don't need me to <laughs> go too deep into explaining this one. Uh, I think Tez is very good. I wouldn't have cut Kaido for it, I think cutting the other Tezzeret makes more sense. I think the other Tezzeret is just, like, stone unplayable and should not be anywhere near a Vintage Cube. Unless! UNLESS! <laughs> unless you also have Time Vault in there. And this cube does not have Time Vault, so there's no way it should have 5 mana Tez. 4 mana Tez, however! Fucking rules. This card murders people. And I'm gonna murder people with it. This is a great swap. Kaido wasn't terrible. Kaido wasn't, like, some miserable card or anything. It, it was, like, a fine filler card in a lot of decks. Nice little value thing. I think Tez is better. The ceiling on Tez is way higher. And building towards the ceiling in Vintage Cube is totally fine. Speaking of which, is this the first time we've got a straight dud for a straight banger? This one's also getting double. Maybe you should get a third. Or no. I think I should be using exclamation points instead of question marks. Is what I should be doing. And this one just gets two. Yeah. Question marks for minuses, exclamation points for pluses. Hey, Star, I think it's the 24 months there. The two years, more subs. You love Fallen Shinobi? A lot of people do. I'll actually, like, take uh, lines that are not great <laughs> in the hopes of hitting something awesome with Fallen Shinobi. It's like an extremely satisfying card to hit somebody with. I love Fallen Shinobi. A lot of people love Fallen Shinobi. Fallen Shinobi gets a lot of love. It's a powerful card. It's good. It's vintage cube worthy. Umizawa was fun to play with and like test out like once. And then it should have gotten cut from the cube. I loved Carmen's experimentations with Vintage Cube, but I do wish that she had been more rigorous in going back and um, and cleaning them up after the fact. Post experiment, right? I, th I think uh, I think Kaido was one that should have been, or um, Umizawa was one that that la overstayed its welcome. Like he was around for a couple of seasons, and it really shouldn't have been. Same, similar to um, Olivia Hum. Will this be a VOD? Yeah, I mean, they're all VODs, formerly beef. <laughs> I was thinking about putting it up on YouTube. One of the reasons we're listening to the amazing, amazingly talented approaching Nirvana. And my, that artist is particularly YouTube friendly. Also just like very chill to talk over. Really good for this where I'm doing a lot of talking. You think Deathrite Shaman is nostalgia bait? It kind of is. Deathrite Shaman's the sort of card... Where are we? Here we are. 
Deathrite Shaman is the sort of card that um, people think as being busted because they remember it constructed and tend to kind of overvalue it in 40 card formats. Very similar to Brainstorm, um, where it's just like not nearly as good as it is in a in a dedicated deck where you can just like play as many fetches as you want. All your opponents are gonna be playing fetches and stuff. But in, in cube, you have to draft around Deathrite Shaman. And the few fetches you get are like getting fought over in terms of resources, right? Like if you're playing Deathrite, now it's harder to play Crucible effects. Now it's harder to play Delve cards. And you're not gonna get as many fetches as you would be able to put into a 60 card deck for sure. So I think Deathrite Shaman tends to be overrated, and I think Wither Bloom Command tends to get underrated. Wither Bloom Command is a really good card. I'm gonna overall give this a minus, but I understand it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a big error because Deathrite Shaman has more nostalgia factor. Nostalgia factor is a, a real thing with Vintage Cube. It's not nothing. Even to you, I think it's a perfectly fine even, yeah. But I, but I do think it's a mistake. Argoth getting swapped for Time of Need. So this is getting a plus because Argoth is not good. Assuming I'm thinking of the right card. Yeah, <laughs> Argoth's no good. <laughs> um, Time of Need's not great, but it will see play in some um, combo decks, right? Tutor for your Emrakul so you can channel into it, that sort of deal. Actually, did I list Time of Need? I might have fucking listed it. No, I have Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time and Sylvan Scrying were the two cards I had at that casting cost. Both of which I like a little bit more than Time of Need. Like, why Why do we have Time of Need instead of this card? <laughs> why isn't this card in Vintage Cube? <laughs> the one that's like banned in all the formats? Sees Legacy play? Anyway. Right, sees vintage play. Sees a lot of vintage play. Bushwhack for Worldly Tutor. Again, I'm gonna give this a plus because Bushwhack wasn't really playable and Worldly Tutor will play see play in some combo decks. But it's not as big of a plus as the previous one. Because Worldly Tutor I think is worse than Time of Need by going to the top of your library. And again, there's better cards. Both of those have better cards. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give these plus, pluses and question marks. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> when the ad <laughs> when the ad doesn't make sense <laughs> but it's an overall bonus for for getting rid of the um getting rid of the pure dud we can play tutor for oath decks huh worldly tutor so the oath into the correct creature i guess how often do you think that's coming up? How often is Oath even playable? Vibes based rating system? Sort of. I mean, the plus and minus is pretty intuitive, right? And the exclamation points and question marks should make sense for um, people that are like played chess and stuff. You think Ren, Ren and Realm Breaker? You think Circle of Dreams Druid getting cut for Ren is, is a plus? I think a lot of people are gonna think that. I think Circle of Dreams Druid was underrated. It's like a backup guy's cradle for guy's cradle decks. I don't think it was great, but I think Ren and Realm Breaker is gonna be kind of doo-doo. I'm gonna give this an equals. You wish it were Dryad? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of Dryad, but I think that would be better. I can understand wanting to put new cards in, but I think there's better new cards. Forest for Elder Gargaroth. Losing the Gargs, adding the Deep Forest Tournament. 
So we kind of had Deep Forest Hermit with the Squirrel Maker, the other Squirrel Maker. Squirrel Makers kind of play well together. Like they both Anthem. You get some 3 3 squirrels. And they're both good with Skull Clamp and Recurring Nightmare and all that. Nice synergy cards. Elder Gargaroth was good though. There's a really good one to cheat out early. And it would just win some matchups, right? Like against red and stuff. I feel like Mono Red is getting a really big boost from uh from these changes. We're losing Gargaroth, we're losing Baneslayer. Um, and then there's also like some nice additions coming in later too. Which I'm not a huge fan of. Like I think Mono Red was in a really good spot before the changes, but we'll see. Might be nearing too good here. The Reach on Guard came up all the time, right? Yeah, the Reach on Guard does come up a lot. So I don't I don't hate this swap. Um, I don't know if it's a swap I would have made, but I'm gonna give it an equals. Minus Garrick Relentless plus Pattern of Rebirth. What do y'all think? It's been so long since I played with Pattern of Rebirth. I think I, I remember disliking it getting cut when it was originally cut from Vintage Cube. More sack outlets have been added for it. I think the Creature Natural Order that got cut is better than this card. Like, you talked about the Creature Natural Order being situational, but you just had to play that in a deck with green creatures. And this Pattern of Rebirth, like, needs something, some big fatty to tutor into that you might not necessarily want to play in your green creature deck. And then on top of that, you also need a sack outlet. So I feel like you need, like, to do more work for this Pattern of Rebirth than the than the green natural, the, the Magus of Natural Order, or whatever. Garrick Relentless was okay. Good in green creature mirrors. Sometimes I treated it like a sideboard card. I think overall I don't feel strongly about this swap. Some matchups you don't need a sack outlet, that's true. But then you're also, like, getting blown the fuck out if there's a removal spell. The cool thing about the green creature natural order is that you didn't have to activate it either. Like, you could do it at instant speed, blow people out mid-combat and stuff. Sometimes that sort of thing was, was, uh, was good. And if it died... The cool thing about Magus is if it dies... You spent one card on it. You're getting one for one. If Pattern of Rebirth, if the creature that you're targeting dies in response, you're getting two for one. If Natural Order gets countered, you're getting two for one. Like, everyone focuses on the negative of, of that Magus, which made it, like, kind of underplayed, undervalued. Whereas with Pattern of Rebirth, I think it's easier to see <laughs> sugar plums and stuff. That said, the article is right that the um, the sacrifice synergies are getting plussed. I still think that means that you should be adding Yogmoth back in, because Yogmoth is still the most powerful sack outlet that you have and <laughs> is actually good and makes decks good. But um, yeah, over overall, it's not the worst swap here. <clears throat> Force of Vigor for Kadama's Reach. So Force of Vigor is a great card. I don't know if Kadama's Reach is the card that I cut. But Force of Vigor is a really good add. Cool thing about Kadama's Reach is it doesn't just make multicolored decks better and give non-creature based green decks something to do. It's also card advantage, you know? Like you mulligan on the play, Kadama's Reach can make up for a mull. Force of Vigor is a great card, though. Is Cultivate still in? I assume that they wouldn't cut Kodama's Reach if Cultivate was in the cube. 
It's just the assumption I'm going to make. I've been ranting about Magus of the Order, and we haven't even got to it yet. I was spoiling my own review. <laughs> Light from the Loam for Seder Wayfinder. I think that's Dece. I was never, I, I kind of hate Light from the Loam in Moto in general. It's a really miserable card to play with. And Seder Wayfinder is kind of cool for like recurring nightmare stuff. I don't think it's like a great card, but I don't think Loam was irreplaceable either. Overall, I'm gonna give this a plus. Quality of life change, yeah. You like all the court cards? I like a lot of them. I think the white one is really good. I think the blue one's good. They might be like too good for cube. Like they're kind of miserable to play against. Court of Bounty is like a really high variance one. And Magus of the Order is not a high variance card. And I don't like his reasoning. Like he's saying creatures that cost four mana need to stay in play tend to order underperform. This is an enchantment that you have to like tap out for and then not get hit. <laughs> and if you get hit, you lose the game. <laughs> like this this one's more high variance than this one, friend. The cost, the risk factor of playing Mag Magus the Order is almost nothing. And if they let you untap with it, you win the game. S similar to Quarter Bounty. <laughs> Add Greaves? I would add Greaves. Yeah, that's true. I have seen people untap with Court of Bounty and then it just does nothing and they die. That never happens with Magus, right? You just need a other creature to sacrifice. And this is for Springbloom Druid. So the argument that Nissa doesn't flip often, I don't think is that correct. <laughs> he is right that he can't even fetch a stomping ground. Can the can the Spring Loom Druid fetch a stomping ground? Hold on, I've got a copy here. <laughs> Two basic land cards. So Springbloom Druid can also not fetch a stomping ground. I don't I don't know I don't know about that. They can fetch a basic mountain. Yeah, get a basic mountain, a basic forest. Maybe that counts. Better support for landfall. How much landfall is in the cube? Sacrifice pod decks. I think this is better in those decks. They're both card advantage, but one of them's a little bit more powerful. Better with Crucible, Spring Bloom. Yeah, I can see it. Thins one more card. Omnath, that's true. It is sweet with Omnath. It's hard for me to hate on Spring Bloom Druid getting added for obvious reasons, but I do think this is a downshift in power level. They're both good cards. I'm gonna give it an equal. Unbiased commentary, yeah. Pelucranos for Voren clicks. I don't care. I boarded in Pelucranos sometimes as a fatty against like red decks, and that's kind of all I played it as. I, I don't think I'm gonna play Voren clicks very much. I, I just don't care at all. Titania for Primal Command. Huge upgrade. That's a plus at an exclamation point. So Titania um, was not even good, even if you like got both pieces and managed to make it work and stuff. I actually don't know if I ever saw her melded in the entire season of Vintage Cube that she was in. And she, and it was like adding two duds, right? The really frustrating thing about Titania is that either of the other two melds were better fits for Vintage Cube. They both had like artifact synergies and had pieces that could have worked well in a workshop deck, even if you don't have the full meld. And Titania was just not that. 
I think Titanium was added because a land was a piece of the combo and there's all this land tutoring. So maybe it would be more consistent to, consistent to get together. But the end result is that you just were adding more duds to the cube. That's how it worked out. Hey Phil, thanks for the sub, thanks for 15 months. Phyrexian Dragon Engine was sick. Yeah, it's a sick card. Anyway, really glad to see Titania go. Really glad to see Primal Command back. Primal Command isn't like some busted card or anything like that, but it fits a lot of decks. It's like just kind of like a versatile card. Um, it can do really work in combo decks where you're like shuffling key pieces back in. It can do work in ramp decks. It can do work in like value control decks. Yeah, it's just good. One of my favorite memories in Vintage Cube was a time walk deck um, where I was just like drawing through my deck over and over and using Primal Command to shuffle everything back in. So yeah, it's cool. It's cool to see it back. Tovalar's Huntmaster out, Tooth and Nail in. I don't know. Um, I don't know about this pick. I know Tooth and Nail has a lot of nostalgia, like probably more than Huntmaster does. Huntmaster was like kind of fillerish. I think overall I might give it a plus. You're big on this change. Tooth and Nail's iconic. Yeah, that's the thing about Tooth and Nail is that it is like an iconic card. Better than the fun scale. It is a fun card too. I think I played Tooth and Nail as like ha like half a show and tell a lot of the time. I'm convinced. I'll give her a plus. Don't feel strongly about it, but there are some mom cards coming in. Yeah, I'm not gonna list them all. I'm stupid dumb. I'm in the middle of a thing here. <laughs> All right, DRC getting cut for Orcish Lumberjack. So a lot of people really like Orcish Lumberjack. It is a sweet card, but I think this is overall a negative. So Breach is a card in this format, and Dragon's Rage Channeler is a kind of like a, a good creature for a few different decks. I'm not even that huge on Dragon's Rage Channeler, but it's like undeniably a good creature. It's good in blue-red tempo. It's good in some mono-red shells. And it's good in Breach combo decks. And Orcish Lumberjack is very good in like one very specific deck, assuming the stars align. And it is a sweet card. It's certainly a sweeter card than Dragon's Rage Channeler, but it's also a little dog shit. It's, 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 it's also a little bit dog shit. Um, I expect some people are gonna have a lot of fun with Orcish Lumberjack. I expect I'm going to be one of those people that will have a lot of fun with Orcish Lumberjack. But I also expect that after uh, a week or so, that card's gonna be going last pick a lot. And Dragon's Rage Channeler would have been like a key card for a lot of different decks that would have loved it. That's what I expect. Expect. <laughs> you disagree with the explanation? My explanation or the written one here? The Channeler is tough to get going reliably. If you want an aggro red one drop, I think there's better choices. Orcish Lumberjack is moving in a different direction. What? Yeah, I don't think Channeler is that tough to get going. <laughs> yeah, and he's not cutting it for Jackal Pup. You know, he's cutting it for Orcish Lumberjack. Miria for Xenagos. I'm not huge on Xenagos. I'm not sure how much play it's going to seem. But Miria was pretty dog shit. Miria was another one that was like a cool, a cool experiment, but should have gotten cut after one season. It just wasn't very good. The fact that Miria doesn't work with tokens makes it really inconsistent. Very difficult to build around in gruel colors. Anyway, we'll see. Hopefully if Xenagos is dog shit, it gets cut, but for now this is a plus. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. <clears throat> I 
expansion explosion for Sahili. Sahili is the three mana one that spits out one ones, right? Yeah, that's fine. Expansion explosion didn't see much use. Sahili is not great. I would play. I don't think you need to add a blue red card. I would. I would have left the thousand year storm in, or I would have played. Um, the Shark Maker over Sahili. I think the Shark Maker is a lot better. But whatever. Still better than Expansion Explosion. Shark's much better, yeah. The new Shark, but I don't know. The old Shark's still in. You have too much of a th soft spot for Thousand Year Storm. Yeah. I mean, Thousand Year Storm doesn't get played super often. And Third Path I kind of classed is quite good. So overall, I'm going to give this a plus. But... Anyway. Thousand Year Storm is certainly a sweet card. Cutting Creek, Pricking Tar Pit for Underground River. White Blue gets to keep Colonnade out of respect and archetype function. What? I think Tar Pit is arguably better than Colonnade in Vintage Cube. It, uh, it kills a lot of Planeswalkers. Really good in those like Bugger Grixis style control decks. And even like wins games, you know, on its own. An underground river is kind of dog shit. It's kind of dog shit fixing. Yeah, you're, you're cutting an ace for a dud here. I'm gonna give that two question marks. Tarpit's like a actively good land that you wanna take aggressively. What about the blue-black archetype function? Yeah, exactly. It's like that he, he's, he's like, he's just saying that he respects blue-white, but not blue-black. Or he hasn't drafted blue-black much, but blue-black's great. It's a lot less great now, but <laughs> oh well. You first picked Tarpit happily? Yeah, me too. If you're in the colors already, it's a great pickup. Fixing in a win con. No, Rogue. The you see his logic. He he wrote it out. <laughs> we don't have to make guesses as to logic. The logic is written here. Sort of super nothing. A lot of the black cuts were swapping out like um, um, one type of creature for another type of creature. The one thing that could like fit that supposition that he wants to move blue black away from being a control color was swapping out uh, the Planeswalker, the Ashiok Mill card for the the two two, but swapping a single. A single creature and a single land in is not gonna overall change the color identity in the cube. What blue and black are trying to do. Blue's role as a control uh, color is still gonna be there with all the counter magic. You know, he hasn't touching all of that. Black still has all of its discard and removal. Not that drastic of a change, just some strict downgrades. Field the Dead wasn't paying off. Yeah. For who? <laughs> well, I don't mind any City of Traders, but I think he is underrating Field of the Dead. I don't think it was huge, but it was something for Golos to do. 
Catching Golos in prime time into win cons in the Dirtle deck. I'm overall neutral on this. I want to give it. I want to give it a question mark because of his reasoning, though. Hey, Mr. Kozen. Thanks for the sub. Thanks for the two months. It means they didn't like feel the dead. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for the explanation. City seems like a solid add. Yeah, maybe. City's like not a great card to play early, but it'll be good in like sneak attack style decks. Not the worst. You're just like making some types of decks worse and some types of decks better with that swap, which is a fine thing to do, but it doesn't mean that Field of the Dead was bad. People played it and won with it. It was like free in some, some archetypes. Good in some. I don't hate the Lava Claw Reaches swap. I do hate the Raging Ravine swap. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna give them both minuses. Pain lands suck. Those lands suck. Creature lands are good. I'm more confident the Raging the Raging Ravine swap is bad because Raging Ravine is more often like a like an actual threat than Lava Claw Reaches, which is a little bit more vulnerable. Vorn Clicks just got added too. That card's sweet with Raging Ravine. Is there anything good about the changes? Yeah. Everything that I've put a plus in front of. Equal I'm neutral on, minus I'm down on, and then pluses are positive. So it's been it's been a mixed bag for sure but not really something I can go over all the way with you, right? I'm in the middle of the thing. Wrong Vorn Clicks. Oh, is it the new Vorn Clicks? I guess I still don't care about that swap, but uh, yeah, interesting. What are question marks and exclamation points? What are question marks and exclamation points in, uh, in regular text? So the Creeping Tar Pit for Underground River is a big negative, and I'm questioning it twice. I am very, very perplexed by the change. Whereas just a regular positive or a regular negative means that I understand the change. It's intuitive to me. And exclamation point means that I am confident in that, in my rating. I'm emphatic about the plus mark. The question marks in the, um, Exclamation points are augmenting the rating, which is still a plus, a minus, or an equals. It's like chess, exactly. I'm planning on putting it on YouTube, but I can't promise anything, Admiral. Yeah, not very many of those, JP Feinberg. Like here, I put an equals and a question mark because I wasn't really sure where the, the reasoning was coming from. But I also think it's an okay swap. All right, Progenitus for a Trexa. I'm gonna give that a plus and an exclamation point. That's exactly the swap that I would make. Atrax is gonna be a really cool one to natural order for. Losing Progenitus is like, not nothing, but it was pretty much just a natural order card. The downside to this swap, it's not pure upside. The downside is, as the natural order player, you could get Progenitus very, very late, and you're not gonna be able to do that with Atraxa, because Atrax is also gonna go into reanimator decks and sneak attack decks. People are gonna be fighting it over, over it a lot more. Not only a better card than Progenitus, but it also fits a lot more archetypes. Which is why it's a plus, but it will, will be a little bit rougher for a certain type of natural order player. Progenitus is boring. A little boring. It's still sweet to murder somebody with on turn three or whatever.
they did take show and tell out of. Blood Tithe Harvester for Mayhem Devil. I think that's a solid, a solid swap. So I explained this earlier. Um, Carmen kind of, kind of like moved a little bit into sacrifice, being a supported archetype, which is a, was a fine experiment, but didn't quite do enough to support it. And then um, in the overhaul, like never really fixed it, didn't go like harder into it or like move away from it entirely. And I think one of those two things needed to happen. So I am glad to see cards that actually are payoffs for sacrifice, like Mayhem Double and Blood Artist being added to the cube. Cause, um, Cause that's one of the one of the two ways to to fix the issue. So yeah, overall I think that's a good swap. Not the Blood Tithe Harvester is bad. Um, but the Mayhem Double was necessary. With a certain build path. Cruxa for Dreadborn. Um, I'm not really sure why this swap is happening. Cruxa was really good. What's the reasoning? Putting max of interaction I've cut elsewhere. I guess. I mean, Cruxa was a... Kind of a great win con for grindy red black decks. That just don't have that now. Why could a sack payoff? Cruxa? Cruxa is not really a sack payoff. It's a card that you don't mind sacrificing on the first cast. It is like a better card than Dreadboar though, I think. Not that Dreadboar's bad and doesn't belong in Vintage Cube, but overall I'm gonna give that a minus. I don't think it's a strong minus. I'm gonna give it a soft minus. Why'd they do Cruxa for Mayhem Devil? Well, Cruxa is a better card than Blood Tithe Harvester. Is Dreadboard good interaction? Yeah, Dreadboard's good interaction. It's kind of just okay, yeah. It's not like a reason to be in, in red black. The Olivia for Valky swap is excellent. This is another spot where we're cutting um, a pure dud in Olivia. Olivia was a fun experiment and like a powerful card, but after a season, it was like pretty clear that it didn't belong in Vintage Cube and stayed in. And Valky's great. A banger of a swap. Abbott for Robert the Rich. Uh, I don't think I care very much. It's probably overall a buff. Robber the Rich doesn't work with Skull Clamp stuff. Less good in like grindy mid-range decks as like filler. But Robber the Rich can also like snowball in some matchups, right? It's probably overall a buff for, for red aggro. I think red aggro would rather have Robber. That said, red aggro is getting a lot of little buffs in this swap. Maybe too much, which is why I'm giving it an equals instead of a, a solid plus here. Bloodthirsty Adversary for Bloodfeather Phoenix. Bloodfeather Phoenix is the new, like, 2 mana 2-2, two -two, right? Doesn't that card suck shit? <laughs> oh yeah, this card's no good. There's some really good mom cards to add, and this is just not one of them. Kind of feels like... He wanted to try out some new things, but didn't didn't really know which the good cards were. Bloodthirsty Adversary was great. It was kind of okay, right? It would like flash something back occasionally. I think it was likely better than Bloodfeather Phoenix, but I don't think by like a ton. I'm gonna give it a soft minus. Span Dragon for Gargadon. 
Um, I think overall this is like a dip in quality. Like dragons kill people. I don't think Gargadon kills people very often. It is another card to support red black sacrifice though. And like, I'm willing to play Gargadon in my Mayhem Devil deck. You know, that's sweet, right? I'm gonna give this a plus in consideration with the other changes in the cube. I think this would be a negative if it was, if it was like the only step in this direction. But because I think like Gargadon's actually getting supported with the Mayhem Devil and the um, the Blood Artist changes, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a plus there uh, in equals. I think it's more in that range. Gargadon's iconic. Yeah, sure. Second all your lands for lethal is sweet. Yeah. Um, they do have other hasty dragons. Yes. They're all good though. <laughs> Hazard for Embercleave. I don't know. Hazard's a little obnoxious to get Caracas, I guess. It seems like he's not super sure. Because he asks the question, is Embercleave unfun good? Because sometimes, sometimes people do just die to Embercleave. I do have that, that question that maybe red is getting a little too buffed with some of these swaps. I do have that question. Um, which, similar to the Robber of the Witch, Rich swap is going to make me call this an equals. Red's losing top end reach, is it? Fiery Confluence is coming back in. What top end reach are we losing? Big Red not looking so good. Big Red is getting some cuts, that's for sure. The dragons, They're just the one dragon. This is a single gold span dragon, right? The other two are still in here. Ignite Memories for Jessica's Will is a huge plus. Jessica's Will is a sweet card. Um, and it's a good card. And Ignite Memories is neither of those things. He's kind of looking at the ceiling of Jessica's Will by calling it 7 mana post sweeper. But that's fine. <laughs> I don't I, I don't care. <laughs> it's still like a draw engine that can also be um, also be a ritual sometimes. It's good. Medallia for Storm is cute. Yeah, you're not wrong. If you have a card that can be a ritual or a card draw spell, it's going to make your combo decks a lot more consistent. Even if you're doing one of those things more often than the other, it's just having the option there is going to make your combo deck a lot more consistent. And not consistent in like a broken way. Consistent in like a better for gameplay way. It's just a just an intuitive good swap, I think. Ignite Memories was not only in the cube, it was in the cube way too long. <laughs> it was another one of those experiments where we were like, yeah, we'll try it out. And then it was hot dog shit. And then we were like, why is this still in the cube? Yokel Ops for Fiery Confluence. So Yokel Ops is a sick card and a fun build around and kind of like Red's upheaval in the way that you should play it. Like, you could play alongside Planeswalkers, but you could also, like, float a lot of mana. I felt like my best Yogle Hops decks were, like, playing it with, like, um, Uro or something to get back from the graveyard immediately. Like, let's float four mana, blow up the world, bring back Uro, that sort of deal. It was kind of a niche card, though, and Fiery Confluence is not that. Overall, I'm going to give this a, a very confident plus. Confluence is a sick fucking card. Borderline, too good. That was on my cut list. Yokel Ops? Maybe. We can check. Yeah, I had it. Oh, I also had Jessica's Will in here. And Fire Confluence.
Was Psy added? I can't remember him. I don't think so. I think Sahili was added. Doomsday was a suggest a card that I suggested getting added. These are these are Caleb's suggestions. Enlightened Tutor. Yeah, we haven't gotten to Enlightened Tutor or Firebolt. But those are another few cards. Another few ads that I'm just gonna agree on because I suggested them. <laughs> I thought Doomsday would be a cool ad too, especially if you're leaving Oracle in. And it doesn't just um doesn't just work with Oracle. I can see play and like helping you combine sneak attack plus fatty and that sort of thing. Setting up Shell Dock Isle to put an Emrakul into play, things things like that. It's a cool card for sure. Looks like a lot of my suggested cuts. Anyway, let's get back to it. The actual review here. They got Thunder Ma? Oh, fuck, they did. Well, that seems wrong. I don't need the cutting the gold making dragon, but Thunder Ma is good. It's like the best one of those. Anyway, where were we? We just managed to, to, we were just talking about this. And we're on Koth of the Hammer and Chandra. Which Chandra is this? Is this one of the shitty three mana ones? Huh. Oh, he wants Chandra to be there for sacrifice stuff. I guess. I think I'm still gonna give it a negative. Koth's iconic. It's like an iconic mono red card. And I don't think Chandra is like necessary for the sacrifice deck. It's like good there. I will say it seems like he's giving this like a probationary swap with the idea that like if she doesn't actually do anything in the sacrifice deck, if she doesn't actually perform, that he's willing to cut her next time. So if that uh, pans out, then then I care a lot less. Hey, BR Necromancer, thanks for the sub, thanks for the 15 months. They seem to like the sacrifice tank. Yeah, well, Voltorage. As I was saying earlier, the sacrifice deck didn't really work as is. So you either had to like lean into it or uh, or cut it, chop it out entirely. And I'm like that. I like that something is being done with it. Like those dead cards aren't just being left in the cube. And I don't think some of the additions make sense. I think there's like some really underpowered cards that are just not going to perform, especially those one drop black creatures that we talked about earlier. But I do like that it's um getting adjusted. Hey, Van Jammin Tassel, thanks for the sub, thanks for 15 months, appreciate you. Exactly, you have to go in all, all in, a, you have to either support it or not. You can't like half-ass it. All right, minus Krark plus Karizev. That's a very intuitive swap for me. I think I also suggested cutting Krark. I'm gonna, gonna, gonna give that a very confident Plus, Lelia for Ferocidon. What's the explanation here? With the added emphasis on repeat token generation, this may be a better counter to what the cube is doing than is ideal, but this is a powerful card that deserves a shot in the cube. Hasn't, hasn't, hasn't Ferocidon been in the cube before? Am I misremembering? Ferocidon is not a more powerful card than Lelia, though. Frostodon is a good card. I don't think there's anything wrong with adding Frostodon, but you shouldn't cut Lelia for it. Cut literally any other three drop. I, I mean that too, literally any other three drop. Lelia is like pack one, pick one. It's like a top 20 
Vintage Cube card overall. A lot of uh, very strong Vintage Cube players, myself included, posted like our top 100 cards um, after the last Cube season. And, I, and, for, and Lelia was up there for like all of us. Nobody was like, this card's not good or whatever. <laughs> it needs to be cut. Nothing wrong with adding Ferocidon. The, quet, the cut is very questionable. Cut Lelia to weaken the archetype. Well, Lelia, cutting Lelia isn't necessarily weakening Mono Red, because Lelia was, was a card for any red deck. Lelia was good in blue red tempo. Lelia was good in your, your combo decks that wanted like another thing, another way to pressure the opponent and draw cards. It just fit in like any red deck. It was just like a good card across the board. Rage Paging Ferocidon only fits in mono red. You see what I mean? And it's not really that much of a nerf for mono red because Ferocidon is still a good card there. So you're just making every other de red deck worse every other non-mono red deck. And you're not really nerfing red aggro with that swap. So I don't, I don't think there's much much logic there. P and Kieran for Dark Dweller Oracle. Yeah, this is another nod to the sack deck. P and Kirin was like kind of a good sack card though, right? And more powerful than Dark Dweller by a lot. Like P and Kirin gives you a lot of sack fodder and by itself triggers um, Mayhem Devil and shit. It gives you three bodies to sack to your Greater Gargadon. I don't think this card's very playable. Hey, Turbo Truck. Thanks for the Prime Subaruski, or the Tier 1 Subaruski. You converted. Appreciate you. Anyway. Yeah, I don't think P and Kirin is uncuttable. It's not like the best model red card or anything like that. I, I would cut it before I cut like Koth. Um, but I don't think it fits like a lot of the other logic. Like, I would keep it over uh, the three mana Chandra that was added for sacrifice synergies. I think it's a better card than that card. Rolling Earthquake for Perforos' Intervention. I, I kind of don't care. I don't care about either of these cards. I like cutting Rolling Earthquake. I probably would have added a better card than Perforos' Intervention for it. Whatever. Hey, I'll train 23. Thanks to the Sob. Thanks to the 12 months. Thunder Maw for Rekindling Phoenix. Which one's Rekindling? Is that the 4 mana 4 3? It is, yeah. So Rekindling Phoenix is a good card. It's not nearly as good as Thunder Maw is, though. Yeah, he wanted to add more sacrifice synergies. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just give it a minus overall. I get his logic, I get his reasoning, because Rekindling Phoenix does have sacrifice synergies. But uh, Th Thunder Maw is just like a, a level above it. It's just like a really good card that's gonna be missed. Heat for Firebolt is fine. I wouldn't have made that swap specifically, but I do like Firebolt getting added in. I think that was on my suggested ads list. Iconic card, good card. Correct, Harold Holmes. Yeah, Rekindling Phoenix does have sacrifice synergies, but it's minor, right? Whereas Thunder Maw's just a level above it. Kenrith over Avacyn. I'm into it. I don't love it, but it's Kenrith is like obviously a sweet and powerful card. It is a little odd to be cutting Field of the Dead and adding Ken Kenrith, because those two cards play so well together. But whatever. There's a lot that seems really lame. Yeah, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of cool swaps too. You are being a little too negative, I think.
the core of Vintage Cube is still going to be there either way, too. Some of these swaps are experiments that'll be, like, fun to see how they shake out. Some of them, I think, are, like, obviously wrong, and some of them, I think, are, like, obviously correct. So hopefully the ones that are clearly wrong get walked back. Hopefully the experiments, if they don't pan out, get walked back. And hopefully the experiments, if they pan out, get kept, you know? Uh, I'm going to miss Bane Slayer Angel. I think it's good. I think it's a nice board in versus mono red, even if you're not main decking it. And, like, it does just beat some decks. Forces them to answer it. With mono red getting buffed in a few different ways, I would I would have left Bane Slayer in, personally. But Elishnorn's a sweet card. It's hard to get too upset about it. Are there usually this many changes? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know about usually. Like the cube's been out for like eleven years. <laughs> There's been like a few major overhauls and a few and like a lot of minor ones. So usually is not really an answerable question. I don't think. A lot of the cards that are getting added in have been in Vintage Cube before. Is the thing. So it seems like a lot of changes, but some of these changes are are bringing the 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 vintage cube closer to like where it was historically. And some of them are moving it further away. Yeah, Hub Hikari. I was kind of expecting Boonbringer Valkyrie to get an add in here. That seemed like obviously good enough. And I'm not sure I would have cut Bane Slayer. Like, I've cut the Absin first, which ha did happen. Alright. March of Otherworldly Light for Destroy Evil seems like a no-brainer. this card oh yeah this card was fine it's getting swapped out for ECD ECD is also fine I don't care I'm gonna give this a I'm gonna give this an equal Histerbanalia for arena rector um I like this I like this swap so, but if I'm adding Arena Rector, I'm also adding Nicol Bolas. And Nicol Bolas did not get added. You know what I mean? Like, you mentioned Zugin, but Ugin's like the only top end payoff. It's like Ugin and Karn. I think you really want Nicol Bolas in there, too. I like that History of Benali is getting cut. Because it was like one of the more. Mediocre white cards. I'm gonna give it a plus. It could have been better though. It very easily could get a plus with an exclamation point if we had Nickel Bolas in here. Which Nickel Bolas? It doesn't matter. The seven mana one of eight mana one. Eight mana one's like probably like higher end with the Arena Rector, so that's what I'd go with. I think the seven mana one fits more decks. Just a little bit more castable, right? Either, either one. Hey Shinji, thanks for the sob, thanks for the 65 months. Karmic Guide for Angel of Sanctions. Yeah, so either, so Angel of Sanctions is a fine card, but it's just like way less iconic than Bane Slayer Angel. And it's not as cool as the new Bane Slayer Angel. I'm fine with cutting Karmic Guide, but I don't think Angel of Sanctions is the right cut. I'm gonna give this an equal. Lane Tanks for Enlightened Tutor. So I'd started playing Lane Tanks more and more as a sideboard card. And um, to bring in like when I'm on the draw, and I kind of, I kind of actually was like not hating it as much as what I did when um, as I used to. The card was overplayed for a very long time, 
And I think people started figuring out when and where to play it. That said, I think swapping it for Enlightened Tutor is a strict upgrade. Enlightened Tutor fits a lot of decks. And it's also helpful for finding Fast Bond or Crucible in your Fast Bond or Crucible deck. Got a lot of really cool cards to tutor up. Enlightened Tutor can grab Urza's Saga, right? Isn't that fucking sick? I'm gonna give this a plus. With an exclamation point. I'm excited about this swap. Seal from Existence for O-Ring. Yeah, I actually talked about this the other day. I was talking about new mom cards that could potentially make it into Vintage Cube. And I think this is a downgrade. So Ward isn't nothing, Ward is good, but double white versus uh, single white is already making that kind of neutral. And Oblivion Ring works really cool with Blink Synergies and Seal doesn't, doesn't do that. Yeah, it's a swap that like is slightly better in mono white aggro specifically and hinders some other stuff. Right, exactly. One white white is so much harder than two white. You're losing a lot of versatility there. So the reason it's worse with Blink Synergies is you, can, you can't uh, exile your own things with it like you can with Oblivion Ring. So Oblivion Ring you can go infinite with, with like Relic Warder and Parallax Wave. You can't do that with Seal of Existence. A combo in the cube is getting removed um, at kind of an awkward time because Enlightened Tutor is being added to make the combo more consistent. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know, it's just getting cut. Yeah, exactly, Admiral Lettuce. You needed to draft like three specific cards for that combo. So, what's your point? <laughs> there wasn't always like a like a thing where like you needed them for your deck to work because they're all reasonable cards. Parallax Wave is like one of the better cards for your white weenie deck. Oblivion Ring and Relic Order, both, both perfectly reasonable. You're right that it's a three card combo, but they were all free. They were all like good cards that you wanted in your deck anyway. You weren't investing anything. Like if you draft a Splinter Twin, if you don't do Splinter Twin, that pick is wasted. If you draft an Oblivion Ring or a Parallax Wave, you wanted them in your deck anyway. You see the difference? And again, without a Enlightened Tutor, like it was only getting more consistent and now it just got cut. I think it's a pretty clear net negative. If it was a huge boost in power, um, I could see it, but I, I don't think this is. Like, I wouldn't have cut Oblivion Ring for Seal of Existence. I would have If I'm gonna cut Oblivion Ring and like remove that combo from the cube, I'm gonna add like one of the two mana removal spells, right? Why am I playing another fucking enchantment? <laughs> There's so many good two mana removal spells right now in white. <clears throat> O-Ring is out for Kitten. I mean, Kitten being sweet with O-Ring would have been a reason to leave O-Ring in. I don't think Kitten has enough good stuff to be consistent in the current Vintage Cube. What's Guardian of Gear of Her do again? Oh, the three mana three three blink angel. Yeah, I'm cool with that swap. I think I underrated Silverblade Paladin a bit in drafting White Weenie. Like, I think I died to it more from my opponents than uh, than killed people with it. It was a really, really good aggression card. But I'll definitely play Guardian more often. Soulfire Grandmaster for Tithe Taker, I think is a plus. Not a huge plus, but a little plus. 
I don't think Soulfire Grandmaster plus Time Walk happened very often. Wasn't Steel Seraph really good? Wasn't Steel Seraph like kind of a hit? I think the White Weenie players really liked this card. And it's not like White Plume Adventure isn't gonna like murder people. But I wouldn't have cut Seraph. You had Seraph in your top 15? Yeah. Yeah, so Red's getting some buffs. And, uh... And White's getting a few nerfs. <laughs> and Black's getting some nerfs. Hmm... White Plume might be a top card, 10 card in the cube. It might be. Remember that White Plume is getting added by itself, right? So one of the cool things about... What are, are cool? One of the things that makes uh, Adventure kind of toxic and constructed is that you can play it repeatedly. Like, you can have repeated Adventure effects to get you deeper into the dungeon really quickly and just straight up murder people that way. With only White Plume Adventure getting added, I don't think that's going to happen that often. It will come down fast and just kill people, but it's going to be doing it like by itself, right? It doesn't have the support of the whole archetype. So it'll be an interesting swap in. Again, I would not have cut Steel Seraph for it. Cut the fucking Sun Titan for the White Plume Adventure, you know? Or the Sprint Wing Mare, like any of these other cards. These aren't necessary ads. The Teshar and the Loyal Retainers aren't necessary ads. Except if we blink it. Yeah, it's good with blink synergies. But that's like a different thing, right? That's a little bit more dirtily than Adventurer was and constructed. Anyway, Sun, Sun Titan for Teshar. I don't I don't really care about a lot. Sun Titan didn't see like a ton of play. I feel like Teshar is not gonna see much play either though. Cutting Sun Titan is fine, but adding Teshar gives me is like a question mark from me. Yeah, it doesn't sound like he's very confident in Teshar either. I'm not sure about loyal retainers. You like sacrifice it on your first upkeep to reanimate something? It has to be a legend. I feel like this card's been in Vintage Cube before and it kind of like wasn't great. I don't mind seeing Vryn, Vryn Wingmare go, but I don't love loyal retainers. I should be giving this like a slash equals on the ones that I don't care very much. Three mana reanimate target legend. Yeah, I mean, you can tutor for it with cards that tutor for creatures. Blank screen time. Yeah, now we stare at blank screens. So I'm gonna pull out the biggest changes. Everything I gave more than one question mark or plus as like a highlights hit.
Dude Doot. Legend Shredder for Ilkorm. And the Dream Halls add. I think the smokestack cut might be like the thing I'm most sad about in this swamp. The fallen shinobi ad might be the most thing I'm most excited about. Oh, I like the Zurinor bat a lot too. Did I give that an exclamation point? Oh, and the Kaido ad, or the uh, Tez ad rather. really gonna cut smoke, miss smoke stack me too so many nice wins where we made the opponent so very sad these yeah I think the Court of Bounty ad was a lot worse than people realize. Well, that one's highlight worthy. <laughs> so many question marks. <laughs> yeah, a few old errors that I think were long time, like overdue for being fixed. a few unforced errors that I think will get swapped back like immediately. I got this thing too. Yeah, most of the Painlands additions are bad. I think the um the creeping tar one, pit one was like particularly egregious because tar pit is like the best of them. <laughs> but I wouldn't have swapped in the pain lands for any of the creature lands. They're all good. They're all like cards that I want in my decks that like boost the power level of the decks while offering fixing. In Vintage Cube, a lot of the time your deck, you end up with too many playables. That happens very often in Vintage Cube because your cards aren't bad, right? There's not really... There's not very many bad cards in Vintage Cube. So when you get to draft cards that are like creatures in your mana base, if you get to up your deck's power level with mana base picks, it actually makes them like kind of high picks and, and really, really good. And the creature lands were all that. The blue black one is gonna, the one that's gonna be missed the most because it actually like shored up a weakness for blue black X control decks, being able to actually close out games, not to mention like pressure opposing walkers was really, really good for blue-black. And he was good in blue-black tempo decks too. You know. Any kind of blue-black deck at all would want tar pit. Maybe less good in combo. Zurinorb? I mean, <laughs> you're not preaching to the choir here, friend. I had Zurinorb on my, my potential ads list. Oh, actually, I don't only it is a potential cut too. Silly meme. Let's see, Karmic Guide got cut. Mary got cut. Destroy Evil got cut. Yeah, so the, of the cards that I considered cutting, or that I suggested cutting when I did my overall overview of the cube, 15 of them were cut.
So me and uh, me and Ryan actually have a lot we agree on in terms of what was not working in the cube. But we agree on a lot less of what was added. Literally just these cards, right? I don't think Prismatic Ending is like that much better than the Instant Speed removal spell that he did add in white. March or whatever. What's the reason for cutting Putrid Imp? My reasoning? I would cut Putrid Imp because it's not very good. Uh, I would cut Uden's Prowler before it, but they both kind of suck. They're both terrible. Terrible cards. You only play them in like the worst versions of Reanimator decks, which is kind of what Bizarre Baghdad's doing in here too. Clothis is bay, yeah. Yeah, I would play Clothis. I'd put Clothis in the cube before I put um, that other god, the Xenogod. But we'll see. It's not bunny. <laughs> it's just a good card. But we don't know that it was even considered, right? Like, it's not like he personally went through my list and and uh, and um, like <laughs> considered each card or whatever, right? Maybe he did. He might have. But that's not something that you can assume or makes any sense to assume about. Should Bizarre be in the cube? If you're going to have Bizarre in the cube, it needs to be supported. When I when I did this list, I talked about Bizarre, and like currently the cards to support it are not in the cube, so Bizarre just shouldn't be in the cube. It's just here taking up dead space. It's being people's 15th picks or being a, a trap or, or showing up as like a filler card in bad reanimator decks. Every once in a while, there's a reanimator deck that actively wants it, but it's kind of it's kind of few and far between. Whereas if you do support Bizarre, if you play cards like Squee or the uh, the blue black Squee, right? Even better, um, Master of Death, I think it's called. If you play cards like um, Hagak, those cards are also helping support survival. And then these old school iconic cards actually become kind of good. And they takes it takes more slots, right? But it's better than just having dead cards in your cube that are just there because people remember them being good and are in formats that actually supported them. Loam was bizarre support. I think Loam is miserable in uh, on Moto. I wouldn't have it in the cube either. And I don't think it was good buzz, bizarre support. Having to spend two mana each turn. Now you're spending three land slots per turn. It's a lot. You've seen Bizarre perform in Storm. Cool. <laughs> yeah, having it be good occasionally in very niche strategies does not actually interact with my point that it needs more support in the cube. Right? Hagak's very fun. Hagak's very fun and very good. Um, and it doesn't take as much support as people think. Anyway. You don't want to ask a ton of questions? Now's a good time to, to ask a ton of questions, for sure. You got Yogg in your cube and that thing can wreck? Yeah, I think Yogg belongs. Like we have two different cube designers that are both trying to make sacrifice work and they've both like agreed to like not have the best sacrifice creature in magic ever. <laughs> it's like, what did, what? It draws so many cards. It does so much. It's so good. And it's good like outside of the sacrifice deck too. I don't know.
if I could ban one card from ever being in cube again. Huh. Yeah, I don't think I have an answer for that one. Do I see some new stips created by the additions? Yeah, what do you want me to talk about? Of the, like the most questionable additions? Kanix I suggested a Dream Hall stip, I believe. Pretty good card for that one. What would be a good land replacement for Bizarre? Do you need to replace it with a land? So Bizarre is a colorless card. So like, in the current Vintage Cube, I would swap it out for Urza's Bobble very easily. I think this is one of the more egregious cards to not be in the cube. Mishra's Bobble was added. That was awesome. It's been great. I want more of that. More of that, please. Get this in the cube. If it needs to be a land specifically, these are like three lands that I suggested as adds. I'd probably have Flagstones and Yabamai in this, in, um, added together, of course. Because they play well with the uh, Nether Reliquary. Rip Birthing Pod. What do you, this is not, uh, this is not, this, these, these, these were suggestions from myself. This is not, uh, the article. This was not anything that happened. We've been comparing, like, what I would do with Vintage Cube with what has actually happened with Vintage Cube and discussing the changes. Birthing Pod's still in. Re-adding Tar Pit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, re that fucking Tar Pit. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my ad. All right. Yeah, so overall, some changes that uh, that I'm like a big, big fan of and some changes that I'm the opposite of a big fan of. Um, it'll be fun. It'll be fun to see how it all works out. These were the... Uh, the highlights, I think. The biggest hits and the biggest misses. I like the Tez of Agent of Bolas ad as well. Um, I'm gonna go to the bathroom real quick. And then when I come back, We'll fire up a draft, Tom. If I were to support Bizarre, would I add Vengevine and or Hollowed One? Uh, if I have the slots, Kuja. Like, obviously, I'm not reworking the whole cube. But those cards are both good. If you add uh, Vengevine and Hollowed One in, then you also are playing around with, like, dedica dedicated madness stuff, right? Then you're also playing, like, the... Um, the Ruwallas, right? And I think those cards are solid, you know, and you can clamp them and whatever, but they are entire engines and they take up a lot of slots doing that. I suggested Hagak because I don't think Hagak takes that many slots. <laughs> anyway, I'll be right back. Whew, I've returned. Yeah, so overall, some big pluses, some big minuses. Huge thanks to Ryan for, like, sharing his thoughts. For one, huge thanks to him for, like, bringing Cube to Moto originally, <laughs> however many years ago. <laughs> it's kind of cool that he's um, getting to have a hand in, um, in Vintage Cube again, huh? After all these years. But yeah, I am glad he shared his thoughts. It was nice to see him talking about like which cards he was more confident in, which cards he was less confident in, what cards he was adding for like nostalgia appeal versus power. I don't agree with a lot of his reasoning, but I am very grateful that he shared it. You know, certainly not something he should be punished for. 
to be clear. Props. And, um... It sounded like he's open. He's open to feedback, and he's open to making changes going forward. Which is also, like, I think really, really important for someone curating one of the most popular formats in Magic. Gives me hope. Gives me hope going forward. 